Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Georgia Moss, and I'm the Executive Administrator of Sustainability Outreach and Initiatives for Dallas College. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad you joined us today. Uh, on behalf of Dallas College, the sustainability team, and our wonderful partner and sponsor, sponsor EarthX, we, uh, we are so glad that you joined us today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kara Casey and Darcia Houston, our two speakers today. Uh, Kara is uh, the uh, Director of Urban Agriculture and Renewable Resources at Dallas College's El Centro campus. And she says that empowering communities through increased access to affordable education, local high paying jobs, and healthy food is my jam. So, <laughs> Kara, we're so delighted to have you here. And then Darcia is a holistic wellness consultant as well as a motivational speaker, a permaculturist, an entrepreneur, and a farmer. And you can learn more about Darcia and her business at www.darcia, that's D-A-R-C-I-E-A, -E Houston.com, H-O-U-S-T-O-N, Darcia, well, it's right there on the, the screen. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to turn it over to Darcia and Kara. Great, thank you so much, Georgian. Uh, we are so excited to have everyone here today. We are looking forward to talking about natural pest management today. Uh, we titled it From Squirrels to Squash Vine Borers because those are two big uh, pests in this area of Texas. Um, and we'll definitely touch on those, but we also wanted to give a more holistic view of total plant health to prevent any of those pests from finding your garden and really wreaking havoc on it. So with that, wanted to outline today, we'll be talking about four main uh, categories. And before I move ahead, I forgot to mention, um, this is live, <laughs> so let's take advantage of the fact that it's live. Uh, as Georgian mentioned, you can communicate with us through the Q&A and through the chat. Um, our awesome hosts have full permission to interrupt us and flag, so they're gonna be looking at the chat and the Q&A. They'll see when questions pop in and they'll uh, let us know and read off your question to us. So please, let's take advantage of the fact that this is live um, and we'll just have a great discussion about natural pest management today. Okay, so diving right in, prevention. So, uh, like I mentioned, a key aspect of making sure that your plants are healthy is um, uh, and not being attacked by pests is by just underscoring their general health and wellness. So you want to be sure that your plants are getting enough water and enough fertilizer. So um, organic fertilizer is great. Um, compost is a great source of um, the soil building uh, nutrients too. But um, just wanted to mention that uh, you do want to be proactive about the health of your plants. You don't want to wait until you see them start turning uh, yellow. Uh, you wanna be sure you're applying some additional organic based nutrients to your soil and building it up. So we wanna be sure that plants aren't unnecessarily stressed and uh, stressed plants, once they become stressed, they start emitting uh, stress hormones. So ethylene is one of those stress hormones that plants start emitting. Um, and that is very attractive to insects. They've kind of learned when plants are um, weakened, uh, their defenses are weakened, and they are just attracted to them. Case in point. So this is a picture of our live wall at El Centro campus. Uh, some beautiful lettuce, some kale growing down there. Um, it was growing really well in February. Uh, I think this picture was taken around February, early March. And then of course, what happened in mid-March? Well, we had spring break and then we had an extended spring break along with, by the way, no one's returning to campus. So uh, 
these plants, although they were on a live wall and set up with an automatic watering system, they uh, we weren't able to increase the frequency of watering as the temperatures rose. So what happened? Well, the plants didn't get enough water. This is them in all of their glory. The plants didn't get enough water. They started getting stressed. And so it attracted all of these aphids. Um, now, this is kale. Uh, it is not looking particularly vigorous and healthy. You can see it's just barely surviving. And you can see all of these aphids are just uh, covering the leaf on the left and all around that young tissue that's growing and has all of that sweet phloem and sugars uh, going to that young growing tissue there. They're all attracted to that one growing point. So um, if <laughs> uh, the watering had been increased, if we had uh, been there to be able to uh, support the health of those plants, they wouldn't have gotten stressed and attracted all of these aphids. So a lot of times we see aphids and we think, oh gosh, what do I need to do to treat these plants? But really, we need to be more proactive in um, before those aphids even come in and say, okay, let's take a step back. How can I support the health of this plant and not just treat it? Okay. So um, moving right along. Another source of stress is when plants are planted out of season. So um, not all plants uh, can withstand Texas summers and not all plants can withstand the frost. Uh, there's a reason why we have planting guides. And this is just a picture of some parsley and I think we got some cilantro growing in the background there too. Um, they are a little bit more cold hardy um, and they're able to grow in the spring. I think this was early spring when this photo was taken. Again, um, somewhere in February there. Uh, but you don't see us planting, you know, like okra or <laughs> sweet potato in February because there's still a chance of frost um, and a chance that those plants would just get really stressed out. So how do we know when things are supposed to be planted anyways? Well, we have planting guides. Um, so this is a planting guide that we created for the fall. I'll skip ahead. This is a planting guide that we created for the spring. You can see uh, in the summer months, the so June, July, August, uh, we have those warm weather plants um, and you can see Actually, the latest that is recommended to plant tomatoes is at the end of July. So even though I know it's really tempting to get those clearance tomato plants at uh, your local nursery or Lowe's, if you plant them now and then a frost hits in early to mid-October, they wouldn't have had enough time to fruit. And we may be scratching our heads and thinking, hmm, they look stressed out. Well, <laughs> they are stressed because they're being planted at the wrong time of year. So if we're planting uh, vegetables at the right time of year, we're going to save ourselves a huge headache. On the reverse, uh, so there are plants that really like cool temperatures. So at the end here, we have in September and October, things like collards and kale, turnip greens, Really, uh, you want to wait to plant those until right around this time of year. Because if you plant them, which I did, I did an experiment, definitely failed. <laughs> Tried to plant some broccoli and cauliflower a few weeks ago outside just from seed. And it did not go well. They did not come up. <laughs> um, they just are uh, naturally, they germinate at different temperatures. So they have special proteins that will help them during the frost but they're adapted to those cooler temperatures. So when you plant them in Texas in 100 degree weather, um, they are not gonna do well. They'll get really stressed out and then that's when they start attracting bugs. So an example, this is red mustard back in, I wanna say uh, March, February, March. Uh, it's looking really healthy, uh, 
has that deep anthocyanin purpley color in its leaves, really happy, healthy. Um, but when it starts to warm up, it can only last so long. Um, and you can see on the left, this is the mustard um, after the leaf has essentially dehydrated. It looks kind of like beef jerky if you squeeze it or just like a fall leaf in the fall when the leaves fall and they're completely dried out and you squeeze it and it just disintegrates in your hand. That's exactly what happened on the left hand side. It's so stressed out that it's not even able to keep its cells alive. It's just baked in the sun. And on the right hand side, you can see these are holes in the leaves from uh, chewing insects that have come to um, and eaten uh, the leaves. Whereas before, earlier in the season, you can see no pests were attracted to it at all. Um, it was, uh, the pests were still around and active but they weren't eating the leaves because um, it just wasn't emitting those stress hormones, okay? But as soon as it starts heating up and the plant starts getting stressed out, that's when the insects start getting attracted to your plants. So, um, you know, if you are trying to grow something like collards or kale in, you know, the middle of July, um, early August, and you're having trouble with, you know, flies eating the plants or different um, insects all over the plants, it could just be just like this mustard, uh, really stressed out because it's so hot, it's just not adapted to be able to um, continue to grow and uh, survive in that heat. Um, so what happens is those insects will inevitably see um, it as you know, a, a tasty meal, <laughs> and they'll start attacking your plants. Okay, I'm going to pause here. And um, Darcia, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I remember you mentioning before folks had come to you with um, some collards that were diseased. Yes, I can definitely attest to. That's, there's some people that do have success with their collards in the uh, peak heat season. However, you have to realize the conditions. Some people have greenhouses, some have seasonal high tunnels. Um, but this particular farmer that I know, Trisha Ray, she had um, a bunch of trees. And so it shaded and it provided the right amount of environment and, and cool weather um, and air for her collards to survive. Her collards stayed out for two or three years until the city told her that she could no longer have this community garden. She had collards and it was amazing, but it is abnormal. And why do we want to consume anything that is stressed out? Mm. You know, if you are your whole goal of, of, of eating or ingesting natural and organic produce is to reap the benefits. So you are also at a loss when you are um, eating food that has holes in it or that's extremely dried out. Um, your goal, you don't want holes in you and you don't want your skin to be dried out. So you have to really think about, you know, how it's going to translate over in nutrients and um as far as collards go, I am successful also in another area because I had a Georgia variety um, that was donated to us. And that I just I was like, OK, y'all, this is just an experiment. We're not going to have no collards. We are not going to eat. But we did. And we've harvested off of them so much. However, now that the weather is getting cooler, I can I mean, they're really, really bouncing. Um, I now can see that it was just OK and it was cute and they were moving along at a slow rate. I haven't seen any uh, pest issues yet. But that's also what I was looking for. I was definitely assuming that they were going to be infested. I was going to bring all kinds of disease to my other crops as a result of planting this uh, crop. But it just ended up working out. I won't do it again, though. But yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take that chance. I mean, other stuff. You know, you have how many other organisms and other life? I, I uh, companion plant often, so I don't want to hurt anything, and I won't do it that again. Right. That's so cool, though, if you have a variety that works. Yes. Go for it. That's awesome. 
This is so cool. Okay, so I, what I'm hearing is it was just a, like a really vigorous grower and it was able yes. to withstand the stress, but it was probably still stressed out. Oh yes, I believe that it was because of now the last two or three weeks as the nights have gotten cooler, I mean, growth has been amazing. They were just cute, you know, before and slowly growing back and, you know, but they are really, really thriving because it's in the season. It's where they're supposed to be. Um, and you just really want to, I mean, if you have no choice, that's cool. But if you have a choice, try to get what you can that's in season. Right, right. So other greens that would be good for the warm weather, like sweet potato, you can cook sweet yes. potato greens, okra, um, spinach, the the Malabar spinach, I suppose. Oh, I haven't had that in the hot or warmer seasons. Okay, I gotta write yeah, that down. Not not um regular spinach, but Malabar. right, yeah. Okay. So, Kara, yeah, go for it. We have a question about fertilizers. Are you going to be covering that later? Um, not necessarily different types. Uh, if the there's question, a question is, yeah, go for it. The question is, should we fertilize? And if so, what type of fertilizer should we use for vegetables? So it depends on the vegetable that you're growing. I uh, like to use a general purpose organic uh, fertilizer. Um, if you are growing something like tomatoes or peppers, I would be sure that the bag denotes that um, because peppers and tomatoes need a little bit more calcium uh, than other plants. Um, Darcia, do you have any recommendations or? Um, so I don't know exactly what it's called offhand. I just know that it I was using a a lava rock. I, I don't know what it's called right this second. I have to get back with you on the name. Um, but I I used that this year. I've, I've been successful with it. Um, but I'm also big on composting mm -hmm. and and using the compost. And even if it's at a small rate, like I go use living earth compost, I purchased from them, but I still compost to add to that compost. And that's where I'm, I'm in between companion plant compost mixed in with a reputable, you know, compost supplier. Those are my two go-tos um, for fertilizer. Great, right. okay. great. Okay, so if we didn't answer the question, you just type it in and we will answer it again. So yes. We'll get more detail. Okay, so moving right along. Um, another important aspect of just plant health that we don't often think about because we don't see it is the root health. Um, so roots need to breathe actually. Um, although the plant, the shoots need CO2, to um, photosynthesize, the roots actually still need oxygen uh, because those cells respire just like we breathe. So um, when you are growing in containers and even um, in other uh, beds, it's important to have some aeration. You know, that's why uh, soil organic matter is so important, having those big chunks in there because it breaks up the soil. So it's not just one huge clay sheet. Uh, but you have some more air pockets in that soil. But when you're growing in a container, it's really important to have proper drainage. So um, I, you might have seen this slide from a previous presentation that we did together, but uh, we, uh, when you grow things in a five gallon bucket, which um, is a good volume of soil to aim for in a container, it's a, it's a good amount of soil, uh, I actually recommend using a half inch um, hole bit uh, to drill those holes, not just like a regular drill bit, because that way you are sure that no bit of soil is going to plug those holes. They are huge holes in the bottom of your container. Um, and that has worked really well for us. Um, but uh, making sure that it drains fully, proper, properly, 
will uh, make sure that A, you're gaining enough oxygen to those roots, but also if you're not gaining enough oxygen in that soil, it will promote the growth of antagonistic um, anaerobic bacteria, uh, which you do not want. So if you have ever had the unhappy pleasure of, um, <laughs> or not that, um, of growing a plant and it will teen on you, uh, because you're overwatering, this is what's happening. You might notice that it smells a little bit. So the soil, if you bend down, smell the soil, it smells funky, like um, wet gym socks almost. So that's a sign that there's some anaerobic bacteria growing in your soil. Uh, you don't want that. You want your soil to smell like a forest, fresh. Yes. Fresh. And also you could, um, you could use rocks you know, in containers or mid, um, you know, build a little lasagna, you know, but creating or making sure that that drainage is there um, is, imp is imperative. And then it's rocks and, you know, things are in the streams. So this is goes hand in hand with soil, rocks, water. They know how to clean and filter and interact with each other. So, um, I also sometimes drill holes, um, maybe four holes on the sides mm -hmm. as well. But yes, breathing is important for everybody. So, you know, you just want to make sure nobody or nothing living is without air because <laughs> you can go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Um, so in addition to proper drainage, um, the the next step in preparing a five gallon bucket or any container for growing vegetables is to start with clean materials so you're rinsing out your containers so make sure you're working with all clean tools so for instance um, if you're using uh, shovels or like hand tools uh, pruning shears make sure you're cleaning those uh, so that you're not passing along disease to different plants in your garden and uh, just make sure all your your growing containers are cleaned out. So, for instance, in our directions, we always add, you know, rinse the bucket with soap and water or with 10% bleach. Um, that'll really be sure to kill whatever might be lingering in your uh, container. Dr. And, Casey? Yes. We have a question about that bacteria you were talking about. Yes. Um, Jasmine wants to know, does that bacteria promote gnats? She says that she has that problem with indoor plants. Is that what's happening? So it is from overwatering. Um, I've not really heard about, they do call them fungus gnats. So they're fungus gnats. So they feed off of the fungus in the soil. Um, but as far as those bacteria, I'm not sure if they do or not. I think they just feed off of the fungus in the soil. But that happens because that soil is too wet. Yes, so, I was going to say that too. I think they um, ultimately are after moisture. Hmm. If it's fungus, bacteria, or whatever, they are after moisture and they want that damp. You know, they just don't want water. That's more of a mosquito thing. But yes. Right, right. Um, and a quick way to dry them out <laughs> to get rid of them is to move them closer to a window or more light. Uh, so that would um, make the, so the plant will transpire, it will move more water through its system uh, if it's in a higher intensity light. So if it's in a dark corner of your room right now, move it closer to a window, um, it'll dry out the soil a little bit faster if you want to be sure to get rid of those. Alternatively, um, if you want to sprinkle some DE, it can get a little messy, but <laughs> sprinkle some diatomaceous earth on top of that soil that that has been shown to help a little bit. Um, I've had only mild success with diatomaceous earth. So, but when we get fungus gnat infestations, we do them up large. So <laughs> <laughs> I've also had little success with DE as well um, for some things. But for most things, I mean, it's just that first thing. If you have it, it's almost like the Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. um, let's go put a Band-Aid on it right now. And then, you know, you might want to figure it out because it's not going to work. Right, right, right. Also, so um, 
I'm not sure if this would help, but I notice a lot of times, so when we buy plants, um, they, so I've got a little plant here, can't have a plant talk without a plant next year, right? So, <laughs> so sometimes when they sell these plants here, um, yeah, I'll just go with this. Uh, they have them in these really beautiful decorative like shells. They just set them in. And that's to prevent water from spilling out all over the store, you know, and getting everything messy. But it does not help with the airflow within the soil. So whenever I get home with a plant, I take it immediately out of whatever, you know, foil or decorative pot is around it. And I place it either on just a plate or I finally invested in some plastic dishes for them to sit in. Um, and that helps with the drainage and it helps prevent that bacteria from building up. So I'm gonna reach over and pick something up here. I'm trying to get better about keeping African violets alive. <laughs> I like over love them. <laughs> um, and I realized that part of the issue was because they came in these guys. So you can see there's no hole but it looks really cute and it keeps water from getting all over the place, especially during transit. But I can guarantee you when they're growing in the nursery before they were shipped to the store, they were not growing in these because <laughs> this is a death trap <laughs> for plants. So just take them out, um, even though it's cute. What you could do if you really wanted to keep it um, is drill some holes in the bottom of this and then just set it on a dish. Um, so. Uh, I've gotten a few dishes in places um, like thrift stores, um, any set that's like broken, even the microwave uh, place that I realized for a sister outside. I really like those. You can put rocks around them and it'll look really cute too. People will never know it's from the microwave that you don't have anymore. Um, but yeah, and even uh, pots are an issue. Uh, there's a guy that works at Rubio's that I do a lot of uh, interactions with, a lot of classes with. His name is Plant Artsy. And he talked about people just using the wrong pots in general. You know, you got a succulent in a clay pot you know, which is dehydrating on the other end. So some people are having to water regularly because they don't understand that the pot that they have is actually a dehydrant. Um, so it really, you really, really have to know what kind of diapers you want to put on your baby, you know? <laughs> That's important for, is this baby a pull-up baby? You know, is it a pamper baby? So just make it personable. So I did see a question come through from George Ann there about um, different types of pots. So um, are ceramic pots better than plastic? I vote, so ceramic, I'll, I'll say a few words and I'll let you go for it, Dorcia. Um, I think, so plastic, definitely not sustainable. Ceramic, it's more earth friendly. Um, but um, like Dorcia was saying, if you get a terracotta pot, um, just gonna reach down here, one up. Um, it has holes in it, it's porous. So uh, like Darcia was saying, dehydrant. Um, when you water it, water actually goes into the pot. Um, so it does help with airflow, which is really helpful if you're growing in a shaded place, like on a balcony that it, you know, or a patio area that's shaded. Um, but just keep this in mind, this would not be, well, A, it's small, but if you had a big one and you were growing tomatoes in the sun, um, that would just be a recipe for a very sad tomato plant, I think. <laughs> so maybe get like a sealed ceramic container, but I do grow in plastic containers too. Yes, I grow in anything, you know, I, I, I'll grow in glass if I can, because my goal to Oh, my goal is to actually propagate these transplants that I'm starting. So I'm going to start them in something that's plastic that's, you know, I don't care about. I use egg crates, too. You know, so I don't care about what it is I'm starting to grow in because I'm getting ready to do something with this crop. But if you're going to hold on to this crop, you must know what type of pot it needs. And it's not going to be the same for every uh, plant. You know, you might get away with no holes in the bottom if you're trying to grow an ivy. 
but it's not going to happen for a succulent. You know, it, it's just going to be different. That's true. And I didn't mean to knock <clears throat> plastic so much because clearly I'm promoting five gallon bucket <laughs> growing. Um, one of the reasons why I love um, five gallon buckets is because you can clean them out thoroughly. So if something were to happen to whatever's growing in there, um, get some kind of like a rust or well, um, like a bacterial speck in your tomatoes. Um, you completely compost all that soil, make sure everything is killed off. Um, and then bleach out that container, you can definitely use it. It's a little bit harder to bleach a container um, that's ceramic. So from a cleanliness standpoint, it's a lot easier to work with plastic. And Dr. Tacey, along times. those lines, um, yeah. there was a question of which is preferable, um, the food grade plastic buckets or five gallon grow bags? <laughs> So I always say buckets over grow bags, um, but that's just because the grow bags, even more so than ceramic pots in my mind, lose so much water. Um, but if you're growing in the spring or in the fall when it's cooler um, and you're growing in the shade somewhere where um, the plants probably aren't moving as much water out of the soil, um, the grow bags might actually work better because it increases the airflow in that shady, cool environment. Um, but if you're growing tomatoes, um, they need eight hours of sun. And I honestly, um, when I grow in a 10 gallon container, one tomato plant, I'm watering it multiple times a day um, just to keep it hydrated uh, in the summertime because it gets really hot in Texas. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, it depends on the season, I would say, and what you're trying to grow. I don't know. For me, the grow bags, y'all, They, I think they just, after a while, the way that they end up looking for me, that's, that's, that's the thing that I don't like. I can paint the outside of the bucket if I want to. I can put, you know, some burlap on it. Um, I can dress the bucket up, but I can't, that bag, it starts to lose its shape after a while. Um, I just don't like the way it looks. So, and I don't feel like it's enough structure. Um, sometimes when I want things to be firm, I, I see adjustments, you know, in the, um, in the soil. So that's just my personal opinion. But if I had nothing else to grow in, I would be growing in that. That makes sense. Definitely. Cool. Cool. How many times can you use a grow bag over again, by the way, multiple times? I, I have no idea. It just seems to me one season and it's like kind of a wrap, but um, maybe that is that temporary, you know, maybe a good gift. Um, I always said if I wanted to buy some trees, maybe I would buy them in that so I can just like, the, <laughs> you know, cut the side or something of that nature just to get it out. Um, maybe potatoes, you know, I might so that because I had a hard time last season getting all my potatoes out of a bucket. Um, I really had to do a lot of maneuvering and broke a few. I was upset about that because I just want them to be whole. But yeah, I think that it just depends on what you're growing. But I don't know how many times you can use it, I guess, until it falls apart. Right. right. I love it. So excellent segue into, I can advance the slide here, potatoes. <laughs> potatoes are an easy container plant to grow. So if you're looking for some, I don't start them now because it's too late now for fall, but in the springtime, it's just a few weeks away, honestly, well, months, but uh, February, early February. Um, so just start looking for those seed potatoes in a few months and they're really easy to grow. Okay, so next tip for prevention, leaving room for airflow. So this is a picture of different planting densities of turnip greens. So on the left, we've got some high density, um, what you could almost call microgreens, turnip greens. And in the middle, a few uh, less. And then on the right hand side, even fewer. And you can see uh, the ones on the left are actually all competing with each other for resources. So if you have 100, 
seedlings competing for the same amount of water as 10 seedlings, think about, you know, the resources that are, they're competing for there um, and the sunlight. So they're a little bit uh, smaller and a little bit weaker, but also uh, because they're so densely packed together there, it keeps the moisture in that leaf canopy and that's a perfect home for bacteria and for fungi that are pathogenic to your plants. So you want to think of like um, a vineyard, how the vines are pruned up on those support um, structures and air can just move through all of those grapes. You want something like that where air can move through all of your leaves so that after it rains, um, the leaves can dry out and they won't be as disease prone. Um, and along with that, you definitely want to prune back your plants as well. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide. This is what they look like close up. So you can see on the left hand side how um, they're so densely packed in there. They don't dry out, whereas the one on the right, their leave, its leaves would dry out a lot faster. Okay. So uh, case in point, so this is a tomato plant in I think end of like March, early April. It still uh, hasn't hit 100 degrees yet. Super happy, you know, uh, you plant your first tomato plant and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know why I had so much trouble the last season. This is so easy. I finally found the perfect variety. <laughs> And then boom, boom yeah, overnight, it just seems like to get attacked by disease. Now, um, we want to prevent this by pruning it. So if we go back, it's not just because it's cool temperatures, even though that does affect it. Look at how much airflow can move through this leaf canopy here, right? So um, it's, it's still young. Uh, the, the leaves aren't as compacted together, whereas in this example, all those branches are so compressed against each other. The leaves are um, on top of each other. They're all around the fruit. Um, it would take a long time after a rain episode for this uh, area to dry out. And that's just a perfect home for those pathogens. Um, so we wanna prevent that by pruning. So this is an example of what a well-pruned tomato plant looks like. You don't want to prune all your leaves off because, of course, those are our sugar factories, right? You need those leaves in order to photosynthesize and create all those sugars to sustain the plant and create all those fruits and also shade that fruit because you don't want the fruit exposed to direct sunlight or else you'll get sun skull. Um, but along the base here, along that soil, you want to be sure that you're clipping off and I put those white arrows in there so that you can see you want to clip off those leaves almost at the branch, that main branch there, uh, so that they are not picking up pathogens from the soil. And in addition, you'll notice they also have a nice mulch on top of the soil, which is keeping those spores down from splashing up onto the plant and spreading disease onto those lower leaves. So you can see how um, after a rain, this plant would dry out a lot faster. So um, before I move on, Darcia, did you have anything to add about pruning out canopies? Um, pruning went very well this year for me. Um, however, I wasn't that successful with tomatoes in all of the gardens that I work in. Um, and I think that pruning too late um, I guess performing surgery too late on these, you know, crops, you have to really think about how they're going to feel. And then as far as lower hanging fruit for me, um, used to farm at Paul Quinn, I would harvest the lower hanging tomatoes, regardless of what color or if they were ready or not, um, and then just sell those as green tomatoes, mm. just because I did not want to miss or them to ripen and attract. Um, I had so many to worry about, you know, I didn't just have a few. So that makes it extremely different. 
Um, but for my safety and, you know, there's a lot more crop to be uh, compromised um, when you're farming commercially. So I did make sure I I just sold everything as green tomatoes at the bottom. Definitely. That makes sense. That way you have a uniform harvest. Yes. That's awesome. Cool. I, I think I saw a question come through, but I, I couldn't read it all there. Oh, I think it was something about organic mulch. So our mulch, we actually recycle newspaper. <laughs> um, and the city, I believe, or is it park that gives away um, free uh, wood chippings? A lot of places do, but that makes me nervous and makes me scared because they're so quick. The companies will say, oh, yeah, we'll deliver the free, you know, mulch or the wood chips to you. They're not telling them that it's 100 percent fresh. And if you put that on your crops, that's going to rob your crops of nutrients. So the wood chips need to sit at least four weeks i say for four months you know i want to see some mycelium i want to see some activity happening you i want to see you already breaking down um but there are several spaces i know that uh for a while i was calling owen a farm off of john west um susie marshall to ask to pick up wood chips that i knew had been delivered um like last year uh, she has a rotation of wood chips. And then in Duncanville, I found a closer gig. That place, um, they dump and I'm able to go over there. But I also, when I take them to a site, I let them still sit because I'm not sure how new they are. Um, but it's, there was a funny story too. We planted garlic in October and we got in this supposedly uh, seedless straw and we used that and oh y'all it was so cute it was real sexy the way this looked i mean the you know the the garlic leaves and then it was just you know the contrast of the the straw but um we just end up growing straw yeah because a lot of times how could you tell right so yeah. um mulch i am for wood chips i'm i love mulch i think that oh it keeps the weeding um it keeps the weeding magnificent you can just pull your weeds up effortlessly i can be out there just real cute like yeah i'm about the weed <laughs> <laughs> i have to be out there like you know looking like i'm a farmer but yeah that's awesome <laughs> um and i did see a Question flowed by about squirrels. Um, we're going to touch on that briefly here in a second. I think it might almost be next, actually. So we will go ahead about that. Oops. Okay, almost there. Uh, crop rotation. So it's important to prevent um, in preventing disease. Again, soil-borne diseases uh, and pests too, because some pests overwinter in the soil. Um, case in point squash pine borer actually <laughs> so you don't want to plant squash in the same place two seasons in a row just move it over uh just mm -hmm. a little bit you know um so here's an example so here's an example um you might have three different garden beds or you can break it up into three different areas of your garden um you might plant tomatoes uh one season and then the next season, like in the spring and then in the fall, you could plant a legume like a bean plant um, or a peanut even. Um, and then the next season you would want to plant carrots or um, another family. So what do I mean by family? We'll go back. So tomatoes. So family is essentially just plants that are related to each other and attract the same types of pests. So um, eggplants, tomatoes, peppers are all in that tomato nightshade family. Squash, so zucchini, winter squash, like acorn and butternut, um, and summer squash, crookneck squash, they're all related and attract the same squash vine borer type pests. Um, cucumber too. Bean family, so um, of course, beans. <laughs> and then the onion family, so green onions, garlic, um, shallots, leeks, 
um, those are all related. So just don't have a designated section. I know it's hard because sometimes, you know, one portion of your house gets the most sun or your yard gets the most sun. Um, of course, you don't have to worry about it if you're planting in containers, you know. <laughs> That's what I was just getting ready to say. I said, if you can't crop rotate because of your situation, this is when you incorporate your containers. Yep, yep, exactly. Love it, love it. Great minds. So I think like there. Um, so yeah, just just rotate them. You know, tomatoes one year and then um, squash the next um, and you'll be good to go or, yeah. or beans. Okay, cool. So, uh, moving on, uh, squirrels. So, <laughs> um, squirrels uh, are pesky, and uh, all the different chemical deterrents that are out there, I haven't found one that works. Some folks say that if you sprinkle um, red pepper, like the cayenne, the capsaicin, uh, scares them away. They don't like those strong smells. Um, I do find that if I put mint around my plants, they're a little bit more deterred, but for a foolproof method, if you can find a way to just mechanically, physically keep them away from your plants with a fence, that is the best method. Just if you invest in some form of structure like this, that would uh, go a long ways. Um, and it doesn't have to be as complex as this framed out system. Um, it could be something over um, a raised bed, a hoop uh, system here. What I do uh, for containers, so I noticed that squirrels, we have trees around our area here and um, our neighbors actually feed the squirrels. So I'm super excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gosh, people. Um, it's great. They got to eat too. Um, but, but, and they um, have no problem eating. That's the thing. Exactly, right? So what I do is cover them with a screen right after I plant something. So like if I, I just planted potatoes like a month ago. And before, um, when that soil is fresh, there's something about it that attracts them to freshly disturbed soil or those fresh seedlings. So I just cover it um, with a screen while it's still coming up through the soil and while that soil is settling down. And I found that that really helps. Um, also keeps my dogs off of my plants too, because they love to sit <laughs> on top of my containers as well. So. <laughs> Have you found anything that works well, Darcia, for squirrels? No, I think that these little sisters are um, ridiculous and, they, and we need to call the police or somebody because they need, I don't know, I think trapping, which is what I'm trying to say, um, and maybe we can take them to court. I don't know what we can get, but they are atrocious. They are just invasive for me. And like you said, a structure being built. Um, I've tried mints and many different things. I was actually scared because my dad has a uh, uh, peach and pear trees and all the squirrels do is just sit up there and eat while he's watching and they leave the little seeds. Mm -hmm. on the fence so um he went and got something that was supposed to send out signals that was supposed to you know eradicate anything in the attic or squirrels or any kind of rodent but i was instantly for as a holistic health and wellness i was concerned so you mean to tell me this like gets them away what does it do for you what does it do to you as you being in the house, this, this, I don't appreciate not knowing the research on this. So I don't want to use that method only because I don't know anything about it. But um, yeah, I think that nets over the grapes. I'm having a lot of people with their grapes having issues in squirrels, persimmons, trees, and you can't put a tree in this structure. So, you know, I don't know what else to plant to give it that because I think they think everything is a buffet. You know, they know that if I plant a trap crop or something, they still come and get what they want. So I'm I'm not sure about squirrels other than, I mean, Beverly Hillbilly, you know, they like actually ate the game. Maybe we just got to get back to eating game. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's resourceful. <laughs> right. So, so we did have one question from Heather about okay. this 
squirrels at her house like to chew on cedar wood pieces on top of her home. And so she's replaced the wood and repainted it, but they still chew on it. So, so there's, you know, and you can't really put a barrier around that. So there's, there's nothing you said, maybe the, the pepper could be tried, but have you heard of anything else? And also I have some very dirty squirrels myself used to, when I would knock on the window, they would get out of our bird feeder, but now they won't even get out unless I actually go to the door and go chase them away. I mean, they, guys are brave. They set up residence, like, hey, get out of my house. <laughs> right, um, that's how it sounds. I would, I would, um, yeah, at that rate, I mean, if it's affecting your house structure, I would call some form of control, pest control, like a professional, but yeah, I don't. That's know. what I would do too, because they're chewing on wood. I mean, this is, that is just, I'm not going to say abnormal, but they have to, if then they keep doing it, it's something in there that they have to have. To me, they're not eating, but they're trying to get where they're, they have to be somewhere. That's yeah. what they're telling me. That structure. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Love it. Well, I feel bad for your house. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Don't me love too. that. <laughs> Um, okay, moving right along. So uh, most of our uh, pest management is all about prevention. So now scouting. Um, scouting is essentially looking for disease. You wanna be very proactive. You're constantly searching for it. You don't want um, your plant to be dead <laughs> by the time you realize that there's disease. You wanna find the early symptoms. So every time you're wandering, which is multiple times you know, a day in the summertime can be, um, look for those abnormal spots like this, those brown patches or yellowing. And then as soon as you see them, unless it's a special case, you know, um, I prune them out right away um, to get and then trash it, get it out of the garden. Um, some folks like to compost it. I like to just be sure it's completely out that those spores can't further spread to the rest of the garden. So, Case in point, <laughs> being a plant pathologist by training, I see this and I'm like, um, "Is <clears throat> my yeah?" Uh, there's a lot <laughs> going on here. Um, what? Uh, okay, mold, mold everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so all these arrows, um, I'm pointing to things that I would prune out ASAP. Um, uh, a, you want to increase the airflow. We already talked about that. You want to increase that airflow in that leaf canopy there to prevent it from staying too wet. Um, and by the way, whenever you water, don't aim at the shoot. Aim at the base of the plant, at yes. the soil. Do not, um, they are not kids at a water park. You're not spraying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they don't like getting that uh, the leaves wet. They need to stay dry uh, to prevent disease. So just aim it right at the soil there. Um, and yeah, definitely prune out those yellowing leaves and those brown spots, because um, that will spread throughout the rest of your plants. This happened to me. So um, as soon as I started seeing these spots um, on these leaves, I just pruned them right out. Um, truth be told, probably could have pruned out some more leaves to increase that airflow in that leaf canopy. Um, so those had to go, just an example. And again, this is a reminder of what we're aiming for. Okay. Um, moving right along, uh, just so we can cover more uh, material. Um, scouting for insect uh, disease pressure. So look for those eggs. Don't just look for the moths. Look for um, the eggs on the underside of the leaf and remove them, brush them off, because as soon as they hatch, they're going to produce those little larvae that are going to go to town on your plants and eat them all to bits. So this is a squash bug on the left, and then on the right is squash fine borer eggs. Um, so definitely if you see these little football looking eggs, they're, they look kind of cute, but they will do a lot of damage to your plants. You want to uh, peck those right off. And then 
Uh, caterpillars, I just removed those by hand. Um, I guess you could spray uh, with some form of insecticide, but those, they're so large that mm -hmm. um, you can just pick them right off. And chickens love them. So mm -hmm. You have chickens. Um, it's a good treat for them. Uh, they are really easy to spot with the UV light. So if you have a handheld black light, uh, you can go out there at night and find them. And then just really quickly, some treatment. I put this in here to illustrate, this is a sunflower. It's got some form of um, disease on its leaves, but it's purely cosmetic. The sunflower head itself is not really hurt. Um, so I didn't prune off the leaves just because it wasn't spreading to other plants. It wasn't really harming anything else. So there is some disease that you, disease pressure that you can allow. You don't have to um, prune out everything as long as it's not going to spread to the rest of your plants um, and really harm your yield. So some of it's just cosmetic. Yeah. Um, and a treatment that I go to very often is neem oil. Um, you do want to be careful. You want to spray this at night. Um, neem oil and this product in particular, uh, you can pick it up at most nurseries, uh, hardware stores. It treats spider mites, treats lots of different insects, even treats um, some fungus like the powdery mildew on the right hand side. Um, you want to be sure to thoroughly coat the leaf. You're not just like, it's like the opposite of what you want to do for watering. You want to like coat it completely because that is what's going on contact, what's going to kill um, those pests. So you want to be sure you're thoroughly coating those leaves and follow the directions. Every Every product is different. I know sometimes it can be like deciphering a legalese, <laughs> trying to figure out those labels, but they're getting better. <laughs> and this product in particular is pretty easy to use. Um, and then uh, towards the end here, just mentioning squash vine borer. One of the ways that you can treat it is just by cutting open the stem. Um, you'll notice that you have them if you see that orange frass, like, uh, the excrement from the larva uh, coming out the side of the stem. Uh, so just slice it open with a knife, pick them out. You might have one to two larva per stem, um, but if you leave them in there, they're only going to get worse. And I've not seen too many good reviews about things like BT working too well against them. Um, it just, uh, yeah, squash iron borer is hard. Uh, best way to control it is through rotation, crop rotation, and preventing it by getting those eggs off of your leaves. And then last but not least, I wanted to put in a little bit about um, ecology here. We we're uh, Darcy and I were talking about um, companion planting. Um, so intercropping, a uh, classic example is the three sisters, so corn, bean, and squash. Uh, the squash grows against the ground, covering the soil, preventing weeds, conserving moisture. Beans use the corn as kind of a trellis. Pole beans, not bush beans, but pole beans. And because beans fix nitrogen, it's, it's good for the soil. Corn, not really super great for the soil, but <laughs> so it would need some fertilizer. Um, but because you have the beans in there, it, it's still um, building the soil to some extent. So that is an example of companion plants. Um, and more examples. Um, did you want to mention anything about companion planting? In yes. Um, if you all didn't know, well, did you know that plants? Okay. So when one gets stressed out, one might not be getting water or might be attacked by insects or some sort of haphazard has happened. Mm -hmm. This plant will send out signals in the soil to the other plants around them. Like, hey, watch out, girl. They coming or they're, they're harvesting. Oh, they have the dirty surgical pruners. They're about to come for you, too. They tell each other what is going on. So they actually put up defense mechanisms. 
But just think about you and your friends. Hopefully you have different friends, like, you know, a lot of different people that can contribute a lot to your soil. So with these, uh, you see that we have basil, we have tomato, we have garlic, and we have parsley. They're going to be able to communicate. And if one is lacking water because your drip irrigation just doesn't reach over there, did you know that another plant will share water? Mm -hmm. Another plant will share nutrients. So you want this mutualistic symbiosis relationship to happen for your garden. You want to be able to communicate. Then you want this food to communicate to you. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Communication is everywhere, not just within us as humans. And then trap plants. Those are some other things that you can put out that can grab some flies, grab some mosquitoes, you know, actually help with your pests, your um, gnats and things of that nature. So those are the things I would like to say. Awesome. Cool. So um, you you have these slides in the recording, so you can go back to them. There, those were just some examples of more companion plants. Um, uh, and yeah, just wanted to mention, if you want to learn more, there's uh, ad classes at Dallas College now. Uh, if you have questions, we'd love to help you out too. Uh, it is a major within the associate's degree program. Definitely connect with us on social media. Uh, we got Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and uh, here's Garcia's uh, contact information too. Contact me now. <laughs> hey guys, thank you so much for having us. I appreciate your time and your um, ability to listen to us and learn. But I also love the comment about um, the squirrels. It was something over there. Oh, cats. So we, yeah, um, I thought that was cool. Crabs, yeah, cats. not everybody likes cats. I like them, but you know. <laughs> I, I love that comment too, and I love this presentation. Kara Garcia, thank you so much. Another wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you guys being with us today. There. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and we'll see you next week. Bye -bye. <music>